Welcome everyone to Monarch Services um, Speech Deck Overview 101. Um, we appreciate everyone who's here and willing to learn more about this topic, specifically because this is a reality that is happening within our community. My name is Maria Barranco. I'm a program director at Monarch Services. Um, and I am going to have um, Dahlia and Jackie introduce themselves. Hi everyone, um, my name is Jackie. I am an outreach um, and community educator with Monarch Services. Um, I also work uh, with the Crisis Line and um, as a lead support for the Crisis Line. And good morning, everyone. My name is Dalia, and I also do education and community outreach with Monarch Services. A lot of it consists of doing um, prevention education with our youth, our community members, other partnering agencies, in all of hopes of you know um, working towards Monarch's mission, which is you know eventually having lives free from violence and abuse. And thank you again, everyone, for being here. As Maria mentioned. Um, we are excited to be talking about CSEC. Um, as we know, human trafficking is a very underreported crime in general, and it's also quite very complex and a bit complicated to fully understand, you know, human trafficking, specifically CSEC. So we do hope, you know, that you do um, leave here today with a little bit more knowledge about it. Of course, we are always available, you know, to answer any questions or do future presentations for your agencies or wherever it is that you work or help out at. And um, with that being said, um, our objectives for today are that everyone here learns what CSEC is and how it occurs, have an understanding of the prevalence of CSEC cases, specifically more or less here in the Santa Cruz County, and um, gain knowledge to recognize red flags, and most importantly, how to support CSEC survivors or how to help them connect them to get support. Um, I do want to uh, mention that if at any point you have any questions, um, we do really enjoy interactiveness. So, you know, please don't be afraid to unmute yourself and ask that question, but you can also utilize the chat and either we'll try to answer it live or some one of us will respond in the chat. So that is also available. So also, you know, we do want to bring some light that January is Human Trafficking Awareness Month. Um, during this month, we want to bring awareness to human trafficking survivors and the prevention efforts at Monarch Services. We do quite a, a few different things for each um, month and the awareness month. Um, this month for human trafficking, we are bringing, you know, this webinar. We also have some community outreach events. Um, Wednesday, we did a few um, community outreach outside of our Watsonville office. Um, today, we're in fact going to be in the um, farmer's market here in Watsonville, just, you know, bringing resources, information, and most importantly, raising awareness um, around human trafficking in our community. Um, you can also follow us on our social medias, and we'll have them at the end. Um, we do post a lot of specifically on our youth targeted Instagram. We do post a lot of um, educational, fun little videos on TikTok as well around um, human trafficking and other topics like domestic violence and sexual assault. So if you wanna check those out too and utilize them, you know, share them. If you work with little ones or you, know, you work in a job that um, you work with children or youth, um, you can also use those you know, to, to um, educate them or you know, address certain things with them. So please feel free to do so. So um, I'm gonna prompt a poll right now um, we just want to get an understanding of you, our audience, and see where you are with CSEC and how comfortable you are with that topic. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and launch it now. It should pop up in your screen. Um, so we'll just take a minute or so for everyone to answer it. Um, and there's no right or wrong answer. Like I said, more or less, we just kind of want to know um, where we're at with our audience today. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and end it now. So it should close on your end.
Alrighty, so it looks like mostly everyone here today knows what CSEC itself stands for um, and some elements of it. That's awesome, that's great. Um, those of you who you know, um, know a little bit about it, that's why we're here for today. And most importantly, like I said, I think the number one thing is for all of us to learn how to connect um, our CSEC survivors to services and support that they might need. So to begin with, the definition of CSEC that is provided by the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, um, it stands for um, the range of crimes and activities involving the sexual abuse or exploitation of children or youth um, for financial benefit of the other person or in exchange of anything of value, including non-monetary um, benefits. Um, it's very important for all of us to understand that a lot of times um, CSEC survivors, specifically children and youth, do, um, do become you know, involved in, in the life of human trafficking because they do have a non-monetary um, need that needs to be filled, which of course we're gonna get further into, but just to start off, I want everybody to have that idea in their mind that a lot of time these children and young teenagers do have a non-monetary um, need that they need to have filled. And non-monetary means anything that, you know, it's not actual money. For example, safety, a uh, home, a roof over their head, um, love, you know, um, a lot of times, you know, they come from broken homes and things of that nature. So most of the time it's non-monetary things. So I just want everyone starting off to have that in their mind. And of course, Jackie and Maria will get into that. But to start off with, you know, I just want to have that idea in everyone's mind. And then of course, CSEC, you know, sorry about that. <laughs> stands, it's um, an acronym for Commercially Sexual Exploitation of Children. So what can CSEC look like? It can look like a lot of different things. And nowadays with social media and all these online gaming devices and chats on games and stuff, it looks very different. But the prime examples of how it can look like is of course the sex trafficking of children. Um, this is an old term, prostitution of children. We don't use that anymore. We're trying to move away from using that language. But unfortunately, a lot of people still think about it that way why that's why it's up there but it is not there's children do not prostitute themselves um they are being trafficked um child sex tourism involving commercial sexual activity child sex tourism can be defined as um people flying from one country to another and pay to rape children basically um or if you want to say have sex with children, but it's basically rape. So this can look like, for example, and this is just an example, um, somebody flying from the U.S. to a, another country and, you know, paying to um, engage in sexual activity with children. And a lot of times, unfortunately, um, children who um, do get exploited to, to, um, with child sex tourism, they're not getting any money out of it they're like I mentioned earlier they're having a need that's being filled for example a safe place to live in um so that's child sex tourism um the production of child pornography um which of course includes online videos and images and with the production of child pornography I also want to shed some light to the fact that um as we know, and if we work with teens and youth, we know that a lot of sexting occurs, um, especially sharing nudes and a type of, you know, um, exploitation of a child's nude picture is when they do forward pictures to each other, right? So they send it to other people and then it becomes this big thing. So that can be considered a type of um, exploitation of a child. So that's important to note, especially like I mentioned, those who work with kids and schools, administration or counselors, that's very important for us to be aware of that. And then CSEC also includes situations where a child, whether or not at the direction of any other person engages in any sexual activity, again, for that exchange of anything of value, um, and again, it can look like food, shelter, in some cases, drugs or protection from any other person. That one is huge as well. Um, a lot of times kids, you know, and children live in unsafe homes and they meet an individual that promises them that they'll be safe with them. Um, 
So they, you know, they start, they start grooming them, which Jackie will get into that further, but that's how seasick can look like. Um, another way it can look like is, you know, it, it can start um, online, as I mentioned. So that's just to know how it can look like for all of us to be aware of that. Um, so we are going to talk about some myths about CSEC and these myths, we've heard them throughout our community. We've heard them from children, from adults, from professional adults. So these myths are very common and we are here to break them. So the first one being trafficking must involve forms of travel, transportation, or movement across nation or state lines. That is absolutely false. Um, trafficking can be happening in our next door neighbor's house, um, at schools, really anywhere. You do not have to be kidnapped and moved from one place to another to be considered a human trafficking survivor. Um, I think a lot of this has to do also with media and, and movies that they portray that people get kidnapped and then they get taken somewhere else. For example, the movie Taken and then they start being um, trafficked in a different country. Though that is a way that it happens, that's not very common and not in our community. It happens here in our community every day. Um, being a CSEC survivor is a choice made. That is absolutely a lie. And even human trafficking survivors that are adults, it's not a choice. And a lot of us, a lot of people in our community and our society still think that it's a choice. You know, we have that mentality that, oh, well, if they didn't want to do that, they wouldn't be doing that. And it's very easy for, you know, someone who hasn't been in a traumatic, abusive situation to think that way, but it is not a choice. Children do not choose to be trafficked and abused and raped. Um, physical force or physical restraint must be present for the identification of trafficking. Again, that is incorrect. Um, and we're gonna get to some pictures in the next slide, but people are not chained up or, you know, with handcuffs or hidden in a, in a closet or in a box. Um, they, they, some children go to school every day and act like nothing's going on. Um, and then, you know, when, when school's over, they go back to, you know, being trafficked. So it's very important for us to get that out of our mind that there needs to be physical force um, in order for it to be trafficking. Um, trafficking only occurs in illegal or underground industries. This is a very big misconception. A lot of times we tie sex trafficking or labor trafficking with illegal um, companies or illegal jobs. Um, but no, um, trafficking can be going on at the nail salon, at a massage parlor, at construction, really anywhere. So we also need to step away from that mentality. Um, only certain kind of individuals get trafficked or are traffickers. Um, a lot of times I think the media and just society in general has a an idea of what a survivor looks like and an idea of what a trafficker looks like, but that is not true. Um, there's been cases where the trafficker is, is a woman or someone who identifies as a woman. Um, so there is not a certain type of person that fits the criteria. Um, trafficking survivors will immediately ask for help and identify as victims. That is also incorrect. Um, in a lot of cases, they don't even identify as a human trafficking survivor and we'll get later into how that works. But it's super hard for someone, um, especially coming from you know the experience at Monarch Services for somebody to identify as a survivor. So those are some myths that I wanna make sure that everyone here today steps away from and understands that um, these type of myths and sharing information about these myths that we see on social media that support this myth is only hurting um, the movement of ending human trafficking because it's wrong information. So I wanna ask everyone, you know, if you ever come across a post or a tweet or a post on Instagram that mentions any type of, any type of thing here that is stated as human trafficking, please try not to share it. I know sometimes we feel like we're being helpful, but in reality, we're just sharing misinformation and myths about human trafficking which are hurting you know, the mission to end human trafficking. And here are just some Im images that reinforce trafficking myths. Um, if you Google human trafficking, a lot of these images come out and a trafficker does not look like that. Um, so yeah. And also, like I mentioned, movies are really big. <laughs> One that you know have this image of human trafficking and that is definitely not what it looks like. 
Um, so just some the prevalence of CSEC and just some um, statistics about it. Um, it's estimated that there's about 100,000 children who are CSEC survivors. And again, that's estimated because in reality, um, there's ongoing research on human trafficking. It's very hard for survivors to identify as human trafficking survivors. So there's a lot of you know, counseling and education that goes around this to help a person identify as a survivor. So that's just an estimation, but in reality, the number is way bigger than that. And then between 2014 and 2016, um, there was about um, 1,200 CSEC youth identified here in the state of California by different human, tra um, human trafficking task forces around our state. And then um, in, 2000, in 2021, <laughs> um, Monarch Services um, served around 47 trafficking survivors, and that's a combination of adults and children. Um, and with Monarch Services, like I've been mentioning, and you'll hear this mentioned throughout the whole presentation, um, the number's probably higher than that. It's just that it's so hard for somebody to identify as a human trafficking survivor, and it takes quite report and a long time to kind of have that individual finally identify as a trafficking survivor. And then just in general, there's very limited CSIC specific data, just because one, um, there's a lot of gaps in the data. And like I mentioned, research is ongoing on this specific topic. And then just in general, us as community, as society, um, we do cause a bit of that gap and in a sense, we we aren't well knowledgeable around this topic, which also causes um, causes gaps in the data. So I think by all of you being here today, you know you're you're doing a little a part of getting informed of how CSIC looks like, what it is, in order to be able to you know help those who you need to help or connect them to help. Um, and it's always good, you know, to learn about these topics that aren't very talked about or aren't very looked at. Um, especially because there's a denial in communities that human trafficking doesn't happen in our communities, but it does. It, it definitely happens here in the Santa Cruz County. So we need to step away from that denial or that invisibility of like, well, it doesn't happen, you know, where I live, or I don't think it happens. It does. And I can assure you it happens everywhere. Um, so the first, the first, I don't want to call it the first step, but the first initiative that um, traffickers take when um, engaging with youth or um, young adults is recruitment, the recruitment phase. Um, so recruitment phase can be kind of a way that they hook the person or they, you know, get to know that person or they introduce themselves to that person. So usually recruitment happens everywhere, um, but these are the most identified areas, parties, malls, schools, social media platforms, online games or gaming online, libraries, shelters, juvie, juvenile detention centers, um, parks, bus stops, and bus rides. So the reason why we have social media and online gaming and bold is because that's the new way of recruitment nowadays. As we know, social media has expanded, it has exploded, and everybody is basically on social media. Um, and online gaming has become very popular with amongst youth. There's a lot of different types of games like Roadbox, um, Fortnite, you know, where they um, make these like um, made up, you know, um, worlds and things like that. And they buy things and receive gifts from others, things like that. So social media has become a very big platform for recruiters. Um, just think about it this way. If somebody's recruiting um, or kind of, you know, choosing out who they want to engage into the human trafficking life, um, if they're doing it in person, they might be able to target one or two people at a time. Um, but on social media, you can double that number. You can triple that number and be targeting people at a way higher number. So that's the reason why traffickers are now relying on social media to recruit. And this a lot of times can look like, you know, um, somebody who maybe has quite a few, uh, a big number of followers, um, you know, and they, they like to be on social media and they post a lot and they offer them like a modeling 
job or, you know, something like that. Um, that's one of the biggest ways that that happens, that recruitment occurs. Um, I do want to share that um, in my experience working with CSEC um, children, um, I used to work down in the Modesto in the Central Valley area, which that is a very hot spot for human trafficking and specifically sex trafficking. Um, I worked at a short term residential home and there was a young lady who um, she was about 16 when she um, went into our short term residential home. But she was a C-sex survivor um, and her recruitment, the recruitment occurred through social media. So basically, um, this older guy who was a SoundCloud rapper. Um, so SoundCloud is a place where people who um, upload their music that they make and things like that. So he was a well-known SoundCloud rapper in the Modesto area. And, you know, she had a, quite a, a, a few large amount of followers on Instagram. Um, and this um, guy messaged her and, you know, he offered her like, oh, do you want to come out in a music video of mine? And of course, you know, she she was a fan of his. So, of course, she she agreed to. Um, she did mention that, you know, she went to the um, video set. She came out in the video. They did pay her. And then from there, the, the guy started, you know, texting her, um, started showing interest in her, getting to know her. Um, she would she did have, you know, a lot of um, issues at home with her mom. Um, and there was abuse going on with her stepfather. So, you know, this, this girl, you know, she had a lot of vulnerabilities around her and this guy, you know, obviously preyed on those vulnerabilities, um, offered her, you know, safety and to come live with him and that he would protect her and all these things. And she did end up leaving with him. And when she was with him, you know, the, the grooming started, which Jackie's going to tell us about what grooming is. The grooming began. And, you know, it was to her, that was like the love of her life. And then once he, he had groomed her and everything, that's when the abuse began and the control began. And he started telling her that, you know, you owe me for rent. So you need to go on a date with this guy and this other guy and things like that. And then first she said it was dates. And then after dates, it was like, well, if they want to do something with you, you need to do it with them. And then, you know, it started being like more touching, more aggressiveness and then one day he was like you need to have sex with this person because you owe me for that bag that I bought you and then from there you know the the sex trafficking started happening and you know unfortunately it took this young girl about like a year or two years to finally you know um decide that that's not the life she wanted and she came seeking for help through her probation officer actually um so that's just the way that recruitment happens um and then she also shared, you know, that once she had been um, sex trafficked for quite some time, she kind of became like the, the special, I guess the, the guy would started treating her a little bit more special than the other girls. And part of her survival, you know, task was that she needed to recruit other girls. So younger girls. So she became a recruiter herself. And at school, like the younger freshmen, sophomores, she would offer them, you know, like, oh, you know, I'm boyfriend, um, my boyfriend is, you know, so-and-so and he needs girls for his music videos. Do you guys want to come out on them? So he's, she started recruiting for him. But, you know, some of us might think like, why would she do that? Why was she doing that? But in reality, that was a way for her to one, survive in that life. And two, um, in that moment, when you're there, you're not really thinking about, you know, the effects of that. You're just trying to stay away from having to have all these men abuse you. And if recruiting new people means that that abuse is going to stop, you know, in that moment, in that situation, in that type of trauma, you're going to do it. Um, so recruitment does also come from other young people. And she would recruit at school. She would go to parties and recruit there. Um, when she would go to juvie. Um, and do some time, you know, she would also recruit girls there. So she, she was a, she was a recruiter as well. And that happens very often. Um, so that's just, you know, kind of to have a picture of how that looks like. Um, a lot of times people ask like, why at bus stops or bus rides? Um, and a lot of times this is where children who maybe don't have, you know, access to rides to school or you know they have to take the bus super early to get to school on time and things like that so these are where children who you know um are a little bit more lonely um or you can say they're not with an adult 
and and traffickers know this. They're they're very smart, so they they particularly target these areas because they know they can find children who have some type of vulnerabilities. Um, any questions about recruitment? Yes, Dahlia, we do have a question, and if you can please go further into someone rec um, recruiting online uh, through online games. Online games, okay, yeah. Um, so online gaming um, nowadays, like I mentioned, like Roadblocks, Fortnite, and all these other online games. Um, I think to us, it might look innocent, and, and it is. You know, it's intended to be an innocent game, but traffickers know that they can find young children. Um, playing these games so a lot of times how that looks like is you know obviously you have to make a little profile and things like that so they pretend when to be someone that they're not and then um in these online games you can like um send little gifts or you know like little things for your world that you created or things like that so they start you know exchanging gifts um things like that and then the, the child you know um, believes that they're talking to another child right so they become friends and things like that and then next thing you know um, they exchange like information for example through the chats and things like that and then it moves from that platform to now a different platform um, and then that's where the grooming um, begins which Jackie will get into grooming so with online gaming I, I would say you know it's important to tell our children that that yes, you know, anybody <laughs> logs into those online games, but just to be super safe about it. And you know, that's that's the best that we can do, educate our children to be safe online. And it can be very hard, but you know, as parents or caregivers or things of that nature, you know, just kind of be aware of who they're playing with online. You know, if, if they have their friends and you know their friends, then, you know, there's not much concern, but unfortunately traffickers, just like all of us that are up to date on, you know, all these different <laughs> platforms, so our traffickers are extremely smart and they're getting more creative in their recruitment. And as we bring more light and we shed more light to it, um, they are just finding other ways and other ways to recruit. Um, so that's how online um, recruitment or online gaming recruitment occurs. And if I can add something, um, while Monarch hasn't seen uh, you know, through some of these games uh, recruitment just yet, we know that it's happening. It is important to note that it could be our child that, you know, might be recruited. Um, unfortunately, children do not have the means or knowledge to understand that that individual who is not um, someone that they know might be able to, if not that fr their friend, right? And so it is important that we're addressing this not only as a young with young children but and, and with our own children but with anyone that we work um, given that when Jackie talks about uh, grooming it really is a process and without us even knowing or us educating our children our child might be you know trusting that person that at the middle of the night they need to meet with them at 12 a.m. because they are promising um, they're promising them you know some sort of um, some sort of things so it is important that again we are having that conversation with individuals about specifically our young children can you hear me now seems like um can you hear me it is not it's not very low yeah can you hear me now okay can you hear me now okay yes. i'll go ahead and not wear my headphones sorry about that so once again um what's important is that it's happening in our community, it's reality. While we haven't seen specific cases yet with young children here in Santa Cruz County or um, within Monarch Services, we know that is, is existence um, and that our children could be also involved in that. So please, let's make sure that we're having those conversations, that we're very mindful. The least that we want is a seven-year-old, a 10-year-old, uh, you know, meeting with one of these individuals at 12 a.m. without us even knowing. Um, and so education, educating not only ourselves uh, around all these different games, but also educating our youth is extremely important. I just wanted to add that because social media, while it's an amazing platform for various things and sending out positive messages, it's also been utilized as one of the most targeted areas for not only human trafficking and sick, but also for various types of abuse.
Right, yeah. So um, a lot of the questions are, and a lot of more examples are going to come through as we talk about grooming and trauma bonding. Um, so let me know if you have any questions or you would like me to emphasize more on any of the information given. Um, but yes, grooming, you heard it already throughout this presentation and you're gonna become a lot more familiar with it by the end of the presentation um, because it's such an important aspect for C-sex survivors, right? So um, grooming is a process in where the person who causes harm or the trafficker um, establishes a relationship or a very strong emotional connection with the survivor. Um, and it's a, it normally is through a very gradual and calculated process um, that involves different stages. Um, and this is what makes it so hard a lot of the times um, for a lot of us to understand um, normally how we see it, um, how Dalia was mentioning, you know, when we see the news, we hear like, oh, this person was kidnapped and now it's being trafficked. And not to say that it doesn't happen, it does, but usually um, force and restraint is not used for in C-sex survivors because of this grooming process. Um, and it also makes it a lot harder for them to report it because like Dalia said, they don't see themselves as a victim of a crime. Um, they see themselves of like, I was uh, in a relationship with someone and then that person just wasn't good enough to me, and, but they don't see themselves as a victim of a crime or identify themselves as a survivor. So that's why also our numbers can be very low when we talk about C6 survivors. Um, it is important as well to know that although grooming is very important, um, it is only a criminal offense um, if the survivor is under the age of 16. So that means, um, although that's great that we see it now as a criminal offense, it means that there's still a lot um, of work to do in this area. And hopefully with all of us as service providers, the more we learned and the more we advocate for C6 survivors, we'll be able to um, really help them as best we can. Um, and so, for example, with targeting, it that's our very first um, stage in the grooming process. And it has been shared with uh, a lot of the traffickers that they can go into a room and they'll be able to identify uh, a potential C-sex survivor within a minute or two. Um, and normally they're able to identify this, this uh, children or this youth by their body language, by seeing who's around them. Um, and so once they, they've, they've been able to target the, the person, they really try to size on the survivor's vulnerabilities. And um, although anyone can be a survivor of uh, CSEC, um, there are certain vulnerabilities that make it a lot um, easier for, for a child or youth to be targeted. Um, some of this can be uh, emotional neediness, isolation, a lack of parental um, supervision, uh, substance abuse, uh, fostered youth. Um, and so, for example, to, to give you an example with how uh, gaming might look like in here, um, when this person spends 12 hours in, in a video game, that might mean that, you know, they might not have something else going on in their lives or that they don't have a lot of uh, parental oversight. And so for, uh, for the trafficker, that might be like a, a green flag for them, right? Like, oh, this kid, like um, it, it might be easy for me to reach out just by sending them a message or just by saying, oh my God, I love your content. Or like with Twitch, um, I believe, or even with like Fortnite where you can um, send money or that they can spend later in that game. Um, so like they can say something like, oh, I really enjoy your content, here's $50, right? And so they start getting the attention um, of the survivor or of the child um, just by, by targeting them. Then you move into gaining trust and information. Um, and this is a very slow progression. It can be, you know, it can take one week, it can take longer than that, it can take up to a year. Um, but through gaining trust and information, um, the trafficker can really approach the survivor in a very effortless way. And they appear very caring and warm and responsible. And 
they only do that to try to get um, as much information that can later be used to fill in a need. And so by filling in a need, that's our, our next stage in the grooming process. Um, here, once the trafficker has you know, collected information, um, they will see what is the need that they have. So maybe the, the survivor um, might share, well, you know, right now I'm in between homes or I'm just like couch surfing with my friends. Um, or I, you know, I got expelled from school. I got kicked out from school. Like I get into a lot of fights. And so they might see that there's this need, not necessarily of like big, expensive, flashy items, but maybe just like some basic needs like housing or um, food. Uh, uh, even attention, um, something that they might not get from their friends and, and their family or like their parents. So they're able to, through gaining this information, this allows the trafficker to then fill in the need and then later use that in order to get something in return, right? Um, or maybe they share like, uh, well, I'm, uh, I'm in it recovery or, you know, I just basically, or like through the gaming, um, they might share, yeah, just basically just play and like smoke all day. And it's like, oh, okay, well then let's let's do that. How about I, I'll send you some money. You can buy some weed with that. Or they can create this like dependency on them by feeling that need. Um, and so the survivor sees the, the trafficker as more of a sort of friendship or like creating a relationship, but there's no signs of abuse up until this point. Um, and so one, once the, they've started feeling in this need, the isolation kicks in. And this can be this through physical isolation, like um, trying to create a situation where the trafficker can be alone with the survivor. So let's say, for example, with gaming up until now, it's just been through social media, it's just been text messages, but then they go like, hey, I would really like to get to know you in person and get to know you a little bit more. Or, oh, I bought you these really cool uh, shoes. Like, would you like to me just to see how they look and you can try them on. If you like them, you can keep them. Um, and so like they set up a date and they meet somewhere. Um, and so just by creating opportunities where the trafficker can be alone with the survivor and this will help reinforce that connection that they have established already. Um, but there's also a lot of emotional isolation. Um, where, you know, let's say, uh, for example, with gaming, that the, the, the child hasn't been able to be playing all day because maybe they had school or they went out to a party or they went with friends or they went on a vacation. And so when they come back, the trafficker might be like, where were you? Like, I missed you so much. Like, um, and so they start making uh, the, the survivor feel bad about hanging out with other people or doing other things other than just uh, developing more of this relationship with the trafficker. Um, and so with, with isolation, um, once the physical isolation happens and the uh, emotional isolation, some signs of abuse might start showing, but the survivor doesn't really see that abuse because they so far they've seen it as like, well, this is a relationship that we're building. Um, any questions so far? Um, and so after, you know, you, they've, they've gone through all the stages, um, normally they've developed, uh, a relationship that it's pretty strong. There's a lot of emotional connection, but then, um, this is where some, like the first signs of abuse might happen. Um, and so imagine you've gained this trust and this connection and this relationship with the person. And then all of a sudden they start being very like uh, emotionally abusive where they start uh, just saying things that make you feel off. As a child or as a, as a teen, you're gonna be very confused about this whole situation. And you're gonna start thinking, well, what can I do to make this go away? To have a relationship go back to how it was in the beginning. And that just opens the door for the traffickers to say, well, like, well, if you want to make it up for me, then this is what you can do, you know, or, um, and that's where a lot of the uh, favors come in, like, well, I, 
you know, all I I haven't been nothing but nice to you. I bought you all this thing. I bought you a new headset for your games. Like I have been been nothing but nice. And in return, you're like being super mean. You're ignoring me. You're hanging out with your friends instead of me. Um, and so they they make the survivor feel very guilty about their own actions. And so that's why we say, you know, the, the person who causes harm, the trafficker, has created a situation where there's no need for restraint um, because the survivor is gonna, it's gonna come from them of like, well, what can I do to make this better for you? Um, and so that's where um, the sexualizing of the relationship might happen of like, well, maybe, you know, you can send me a picture, you can send me a nude or like sexting might start happening because at this point they feel more like in a relationship than anything else. Um, and with the, the abusive cycle, what the trafficker is trying to do is to maintain control of the relationship of like, well, I give you this and you give me that. Um, and they use secrecy and a lot of blame and, and guilt trips to maintain that uh, the child to keep on participating in these events. Any questions so far? Okay. Um, and just, uh, for example, I know um, Isabel mentioned something about how females can be like the main recruiters because they're very um, relatable. And a lot of the times, yeah, that's true, but it's because they were uh, sexually exploited first and then they moved into becoming the recruiter. So they know what the process is like and how that looks and what they have to do. So they come and approach you from the experience type of way, you know, because they went through that already. Um, and so this cycle of abuse and um, the quid pro quo of like, I gave you all of this, now I have, I need something in return. And the confusion, it's really linked to the trauma bonding. Um, so trauma bonding, it's the phenomenon of where a survivor develops an emotional attachment to their traffickers or to the person who causes harm. Um, and it's, it's mainly because uh, it uses um, a cycle of abuse that's very uh, calculated, right? So the, um, the trafficker will use tactics of like, uh, I'm gonna be really kind and I'm gonna be really nice and I'm gonna care a lot. But then as soon as you do something that I don't like, I'm gonna show this like, signs of abuse um, or just uh, I'll be mean or uh, I'll kind of ignore you for a bit, make you feel like you did something wrong. Um, and in this, we actually see it not just in c sex survivors, but in all other forms of uh, violence, like um, domestic violence. It's also very prevalent in intimate partner violence um, and any kind of hostage situation like cults. I know before we used to call it like Stockholm syndrome, but we've learned a little bit more that there's a huge difference between um, both. And so we were really trying to move away from calling them that. So uh, trauma bonding, it's just, it reinforces a relationship that the survivor might have with the trafficker. And it just makes it harder for a survivor to leave a situation because at this point, there's no need for restraint. There's no need uh, for force, they they stay in that relationship because they feel like it's it's they're, it's nothing nothing bad is going on. Um, and now we'll move into the other. So uh, how trauma bonding works? So it's it's really it's it's a cycle of abuse with intermittent reinforcement of rewards and punishment. And so we use rewards. Well, they use rewards and punishment to reinforce the power and control that has been held um, against the survivor, which makes the survivor feel like there's no escape, right? So it's it's a cycle and it's really hard to break cycles. Um, and so the cycle, we, we know it as like, a, a, first it's like a love bond. Like they really 
start by through the grooming process, they start developing trust, they start filling up the needs, they make them feel like they're the one and only. Um, they start getting all this attention from this one person, like with video games and social media, they start liking pictures, they start sending messages 24 seven, um, they get money, they send things their way. Um, and so they, they develop this love bond. And then they go into the honeymoon cycle or the dependency cycle, where once that they've developed the trust, they feel the need, um, whether that's like a basic need, like housing, food, um, attention, or it can be, you know, like um, money, expensive items, of iPhones, uh, or things for their video games, um, like, like the, the cryptocurrency that they might use in, I know like Fortnite uses a special type of coin, so they send them coins. Um, and so they feel this in need so that later on, um, the traffic or the person who causes harm might say things like, well, you wouldn't have that if it wasn't for me. Or, you know, I'm the only one that gives you all this attention. I'm the only one that loves you. I'm the only one that's doing things for you. You have no one else in your life. Like basically you depend on me, right? Um, and then the uh, abuse or the de devaluation occurs when it's, um, there's threats, there's forced sex. Um, you, they make it feel like it's the survivor's fault. Uh, like basically I wouldn't be mean to you if you would just do as I told you. Um, I really like how Dalia said her, the example she gave earlier of like, I need you to go and do this with this person because um, in exchange of what, like the, the bag I bought you, or um, I have with SoundCloud rappers of like, I'll introduce you to this person, but first you have to go meet up with this one. Um, and so uh, that's also where they might also use them for recruitment um, of like, well, I'll, I've been doing all of these things for you. Like, can, can you go talk to this person or I find someone like, that can be a really good friend. Do you mind talking to them? Do you mind telling them like what great of a person I am? Um, and so actually uh, a little bit before I was doing um, outreach and prevention, I was a crisis intervention advocate here with Monarch. And through there, I had the opportunity to work with um, some human trafficking survivors. Um, not too long ago, I had a, a, a survivor who now she was, um, going through the court process and facing charges because she was one of the main recruiters, but she was also trafficked herself as, since a very young age. And she mentioned like, I wouldn't have done it, but it was either recruit other people or then me myself being trafficked, right? So she wasn't thinking like a criminal, she was just trying to survive. She was in that survival mode that just didn't allow her to make um, the best decisions because it was her way of protecting herself. And so um, this is because this trauma bonding that happened. And even when, you know, you would talk to her, it was like, she would refer to the traffic where I was like, well, he was my boyfriend. Like, what was I gonna do? He was asking me to do all these things. So for her, she was in a very uh, love uh, and, and long-term relationship with this person. Um, and she would mention like, well, we dated for so long and, he would tell me to like bring other girls, but that they didn't mean anything to him, that I was like the only one. Um, so there's a lot of uh, mind games that they play with a lot of the survivors that just makes it so hard for them to, to leave uh, a situation. Um, but in order to, to break this bond, um, what we can do as service providers, or if you know of anyone that might be experiencing this, um, the survivor needs very alternative, healthy, supportive relationships in their lives, letting them know that this person is not the only one that they have. That, for example, if they come into Monarch, like there's uh, a whole agency willing to help you out in your situation, letting them know that they're not alone. Um, ideally, you would want to provi provide some sort of physical separation from the person who causes harm or from the trafficker, because um, just from letting them Walk, like walk away a little bit of the situation and, and helping them realize on their own that the situation is not something normal because 
through this process. Um, and it doesn't matter how long it's been, if it was a week, a month, or a year, through that process, they went through a very uh, just extensive uh, situations of abuse and power and control that they're so confused. And let's not forget a lot of, of these people, they're very young, they're children, they're teens um, who have experienced a lot of trauma in their lives. And so they're just psychologically, they, they've just been through a lot. And so just creating that um, opportunity for them to have alternative healthy relationships, to have resources and connections, it's gonna be the best way for us to break this bond, right, ideally. Thank you, Dahlia and um, Jackie. Uh, please feel free to include any questions in the chat if um, you have any questions this far. I am going to talk a little bit about vulnerabilities uh, to CSEC, given that, again, there are various. These are just some of the vulnerabilities that we wanted to include. However, there is a longer list that we want to be very mindful about. And um, really, common vulnerabilities with tra that traffickers prey on is past trauma. Jack Jackie just touched upon that, right? We have current survivors who unfortunately were victimized because of their past trauma. However, living in a chaotic, um, dysfunctional household, although that is one of the uh, vulnerabilities, unfortunately also is not solemnly um, that situation. We talked about the fact that it could be my child who could be preyed on. Um, because of the fact that nowadays society is really overlooking um, how the victimization of our children, a victimization of how trafficking it's happening. Um, of course, also those who have been neglected, um, just the past trauma itself is going to be more of a usage of survival mode. Um, I think it's very important to have a conversation about the fact that LGBTQ plus they are specifically, this is one of our populations that we see quite often that, um, you know, they do face more of the challenges. And why is because there is quite a bit of discrimination with our youth community who are LGBTQ+. Not only do they face discrimination, um, neglect, and of course, really sometimes hate from um, family, parents themselves, friends, classmates, and society as a whole, right? Because we as a society, we as, our commun as a community, we don't understand and we don't support. So how do we support them? Um, and so they are a higher risk for sexual exploitation. Um, in addition to that too, many of um, these young individuals who might be LGBTQ plus become um, foster youth, become homeless. And that is because maybe they were thrown out out of their home. They ran away because they weren't understood. And so it is very crucial to, to really look at the different factors and what might have led some of these youth as well to be on the streets, right? Um, unfortunately, runaway and homeless um, LGBTQ plus youth are more likely than um, heterosexual counterparts to be physically or, and or sexually trafficked and victimized in various ways. Um, additionally, isolated individuals, Jackie touched upon that, Dahlia touched upon that, when uh, there's that isolation. Now, let's look back at, um, you know, our data with within the two years. Um, Monarch has seen such an increase, not only with domestic violence and sexual violence, but we've also seen an increase with uh, human trafficking and CSEC. And that is because our youth are being isolated due to the fact that right now we're dealing with such a traumatic situation with all these different uh, viruses, right? And so that itself has a big contributor in the last two years. While we don't have a specific data, we know it's happening and we know that isolation can lead to really finding ways to connect to others. Um, and so that is a huge vulnerability for our youth currently. So it's something for us to be very mindful about and how how is a community and what can we do foster youth um, foster youth are one of the targets um, they don't have while they have the support through the system what they have support through those who are working with them they don't have that specific and that direct love um, and support from their family members 
poverty. Poverty is not only a factor for um, common vulnerabilities with CSEC, but it's one of the biggest factors for just overall violence in our community, right? Um, and of course, also immigration status is one of the areas that we do see commonly within our agency, um, specifically in this community. False hopes and promises. Um, Jackie and Dahlia talked about the fact that, you know, many of our youth are being promised um, the stars. And unfortunately, that is not the, the reality and they become victims. Um, the other thing that I wanted to point out is uh, while we're using the term survivor, we have to remember that these are um, youth that first are victimized. Um, they are victims of these individuals. They are utilizing their trauma. They're using, you know, a lot of these vulnerabilities and all, all these factors uh, to victimize them. Of course, once they, um, you know, come to us or go to you, then um, we're hoping that they become survivors at that point. Um, addictions. One of the biggest things that we have seen and uh, probably many of you have heard is that there is more of an increase of drug use, uh, mental health and drug use in the last two years, given the current situation, but also within our community, we have seen an increase in violence within our youth. Um, in addition to that, we have seen an increase with addiction within our youth. And so addiction is one of the vulnerabilities that is going to be used by those who are uh, uh, preying on these um, survivors or these um, victims. And why? Because it is the way that they don't have the means to be able to buy um, their drugs or their needs or their necessities. And so therefore addiction is going to be utilized as uh, one of the vulnerabilities. Now disabilities as well. Disabilities can be big. And disabilities is not just the physical disabilities, but cognitive, um, I mean the emotional. Right now one of the biggest disabilities that believe it or not, that we're seeing is the mental health that our youth are experiencing. Um, and I just want to point out that again, while these are some of the vulnerabilities that we are discussing, there is a big, big list that we need to be very aware of. And the fact that there is such a lack of information, um, it is very crucial for us to note this. And then of course, um, check in with the youth. Dahlia? Okay, thank you. Um, red flags. So as a community, what can we see as service providers, as parents? Um, it is very crucial. First off, um, Dahlia and Jackie talked about the fact that um, it's happening. It's a reality. It's happening in our community. While we're not showing some of the data that it's happening, we know it is, we're just not able to identify, including us at Monarch Services, at times can be very difficult to identify a survivor of CSEC um, for various, various reasons. These are some of the common red flags. However, not these are not solemnly um, what we look at. However, if you as a service provider, if you as an individual who's working with youth are seeing that there is potential of um, a youth that maybe, you know, doesn't have the means, they don't have a job, and they are bringing expensive items to school, um, to your meetings, um, you know, designer purses, designer clothing, um, cell phones, especially multiple cell phones, um, it is something to, you know, be aware about, not necessarily questioning them, but understanding uh, more of the situation because that is very crucial. As Jackie mentioned, if we are service providers and we note this, um, it is important to understand because they will not be open, they will not share. And so really building that rapport is going to be crucial. But this is one of the um, red flags. Of course, also we will see multiple reproductive health problems such as STIs. Um, and they might share or may not share with us, but if we're aware about that, not only redirecting them, ensuring that they're receiving the services or the healthcare that they need, but also um, being aware of the fact that maybe there is some uh, sexual exploitation or sexual contact um, going on. Um, irregular school attendance. Um, while currently it can be difficult to identify that due to the current situation, if we're noting that there is 
a regular school attendance within our children, within the um, individuals that we know, within our students. Um, this is another red flag to, while you know it might sometimes be a misconception, it is still important to try to understand exactly what could be the situation. And it could be because they're being trafficked, um, malnutrition as well. Um, alcohol and drug use. Once again, this is one of the areas that we at Monarch has seen in our community, such an increase within our different um, schools and within our different youth, uh, really within our youth population that increase drug use and abuse and of course death um, and suicide at this point. Um, mental health problems, um, signs of emotional distress, PTSD, depression, anxiety, paranoia. Now, Currently, it can be difficult to identify that because we know that the number of, we're all experiencing mental health due to the circumstances, right? And so now we can't imagine what our youth is going through. However, when we're looking at CSEC and red flags, it is important to note that the mental health aspect is gonna be a big contributor and a red flag for um, being, you know, really, that's going to be a vulnerability that can lead to a youth being um, part of CSEC. So looking at those signs and trying to get them the support in a confidential way is going to be very important. Um, and specifically because youth do need that confidentiality. And then, of course, um, also, it is very important to note um, language. Language matters. Uh, this is one of the biggest pieces of prevention and what we at Monarch are really trying to work with our community. Language really matters. There's some wording here that I personally, for example, was not aware of. And so being aware of what language is our youth utilizing and doing search research around it and understanding exactly what they're referring to. For example, youth with significant, um, and I'll go into with youth with significant and older boyfriends or girlfriends um, or partners, I'm gonna say, it's because solemnly it's not just females who are targeted, but just overall, regardless of race or gender, anyone can be targeted um, to be a victim of CSEC. Um, and so if you see that too, it is important, not only it's not legal, but also it is important to note that mm. there could be a, a situation of, um, again, victimization. In addition, I am so sorry. I'm gonna ask if everyone can please mute themselves. That would be wonderful. Um, okay, language. So how many of you here, if you're able to put in the chat, it would be wonderful um, that, you know, you can kind of let me know because initially when I was learning about CSEC, I didn't know what daddy means. Does anyone know what daddy means? If you can put yes or no, bottom, what does that mean? And the life. I'm gonna explain what that means. And these are just some language terms that youth utilize when they are in a potential CSEC. Now, there are so many common languages and this is why I'm, you know, I do wanna point out the fact that language matters right? Because our youth are utilizing various forms of communicating with each other, communicating with a person who causes harm with their traffickers. And so for us, it's important to be aware about that. So for example, uh, what is daddy? So daddy and uh, is really the term used to refer to a male trafficker or pimp. Um, bottom, Bottom, I mean, to us, it can mean various things, right? So if my nine-year-old comes up to me and they tell me something about bottom, I'm not going to understand exactly. If I'm a educator, I'm not going to understand. So it is very crucial that we, again, become more familiar with what are these type of um, things that they're saying, right? So bottom is a person, uh, really, it could be a female, male, the gender doesn't identify, but within this um, stable appointed um, by the trafficker. So this is someone who's being appointed by the trafficker, by the pimp to recruit and train new victims to be uh, CSEC victims, right? And also to supervise them and sometimes even to help them inflict the punishment. What Jackie talked about earlier, um, to be able to really, uh, you know, be the ones who are, <laughs> 
um, overseeing that person to ensure that they are being um, victimized. And then the life. Um, I just read here that seems like, you know, some of us do know what, um, uh, you know, some of them are. And, um, but again, what is um, the life? Is a term that it describes um, a situation of being involved in a, a prostitution or under the control of a pimp. So that is the life, but really understanding some of these terms and knowing that language is important um, is very crucial. Um, we're happy to share some more common language that could be useful for us. Once again, um, there are more that many times we don't understand and that youth are utilizing that it's important for us to um, understand. Um, also, a couple things that we will see it, within the red flags is youth or the child um, with high knowledge of sexual behavior. Um, not only that there might be some victimization within their home, um, which is very common red flag that we see here at Monarch Services, but also the fact that um, it is very commonly with those who are survivors of um, CSEC as well. Dahlia? Okay. So, I wanted to touch upon in regards to what Monarch provides and what is our CSEC response in Santa Cruz County. Um, first off, uh, Jackie will go over in regards to more in-depth um, services that Monarch can provide and how you can be an ally um, to ensure that we are collaborating and communicating and working towards ending not only human trafficking, but ending really the exploitation of youth, um, CSEC. Um, and so we do have a Sky Center. It is an interview center where we work very closely with various entities from the DA to the different jurisdiction um, to ensure that all youth who have been survivors of any type of trauma or abuse, that they are interviewed um, by a professional interviewer. Monarch Services is part of um, that process to ensure that the youth and the family is receiving um, not only the trauma informed services but also the ongoing support and healing that they require um, specifically because anyone and I think it's important to note um, that while monarch services works with survivors of domestic violence sexual assault and human trafficking our CSEC and human trafficking survivors what we've seen through our data and throughout the years is that it is a long-term healing process. Um, and so it's very important to understand that the healing is not gonna happen uh, you know, overnight. And so this is why Monarch is part of those interviews to ensure that we're, we're providing that um, not only proper resources, but also that I'm going support. We also have a sexual assault response team, um, and that is through our county with the various different entities as well, uh, with the sheriff's department, DA, different um, jurisdictions, uh, nurse examiners, and really wh where a CSEC falls in with our SART team is when any youth is sexually assaulted in any way or form, um, we do try to identify are they CSEC survivors, um, was this solemnly a sexual assault case and we've seen various cases throughout the years that they have been um, uh, CSEC. Unfortunately it's not immediately identifiable but it is identifiable afterwards and uh, with our sexual assault response team our advocates are there to respond um, specifically to the forensic examination, being part of the forensic examination, being part of the interview process, ensuring that we're there to not only answer questions for the parents or those who are are, uh, you know, really the guardians of the youth, but also the youth itself. And um, in addition, just providing that emotional support, holding their hand, guiding them through the process, um, and being there for them, because that's exactly what they need. But also really understand that if they don't want us present, that that might be something that is perfectly fine. It's their choice. We provide survivors with their choice of having a, an advocate present or not. Uh, really, empowerment under Monarch Services, core services is very crucial. 
In addition um, to our sexual assault response team, I think it's important to note that when anyone does call, and I wanted to just briefly mention this, as we have seen an increase with sexual violence within our schools, within our um, community, it's very important to know that all survivors of sexual assault have different options, and that they have the option of going through an examination, regardless of their status, regardless of anything. Also, if they do not want law enforcement involved in the process, they can go through what is called a non-investigative um, sexual assault exam. Um, all they have to do is contact Monarch Services and we are more than happy to explore those options with them. As we know that many um, survivors of sexual assault specifically sometimes are afraid of or not ready to um, you know, report and that is perfectly fine as well. We also provide a law enforcement trainings, um, and not just law enforcement trainings, but just various different trainings. We wanted to focus more on the law enforcement piece with different jurisdictions, and that is because, you know, we've done trainings to Santa Cruz Police Department, Watsonville Police Department, sheriffs, um, and this is for us to not only uh, collaborate, but really work towards ending the violence, specifically when it comes down to youth who might be experiencing not only sexual violence, but CSEC as well. In addition, we have a um, CSEC multidisciplinary team in Santa Cruz County. Well, it's not um, always and it hasn't been active, which, you know, it's a great news, but at the same time, it can be worrisome because we know it's happening, right? Um, but really what this disciplinary um, team is, it's a team that is part of the child welfare, um, county mental health, probation, law enforcement, monarch services, uh, and then survivor mentor. Uh, the response is that if there is an identified CSEC survivor, um, then they will contact child welfare, they will contact monarch services, and we're present during that process. In addition, Monarch Services, and we'll go into more detail, we also do have um, a set and saved um, room within our confidential safe house to ensure that we are providing that to that transitional youth or that CSEC um, survivor as well. Oh, okay. Um, so yeah, just how Maria was, was saying, uh, Monarch Services has really thought about all the needs and obstacles and like challenges that a CSEC survivor might encounter. So we really developed different programs that will provide as much support as we can to the survivors. Um, we have in-person advocacy. Um, that means that our advocates have been trained to respond in different situations um, and in different places, as long as it's safe. Um, so we do respond to law enforcement interviews. Um, if they need to do an interview, a pretext call, um, we'll, we'll, we'll go to different jurisdictions in the county. Um, we have the SARTs where we respond to uh, Dominican Hospital um, or uh, the Child Advocacy Center over in Santa Clara. We also respond to schools and other locations as needed. Right now, because of the increase in violence in uh, children and youth in the different schools in the PV district and um, Santa Cruz school district, we have our, our CY advocates respond at least once or twice a week to different schools where they can just be there um, and, and they have scheduled appointments with um, the, the students there so that, you know, it's just, uh, they have an open door there if they want to come in and talk to some of our advocates. We're also responding to schools. Um, I believe they go out like Thursdays and Wednesdays to different schools. Um, so we've definitely tried to work with our uh, local uh, school districts to just provide that um, opportunity for a lot of our students um, and, and, and children and youth in the area. Um, like we mentioned, you know, for in order to uh, break that bond that the survivor has developed with the person who causes harm, we need to introduce them to um, healthier uh, resources and relationships. So our children youth program, um, we have support groups where they get to meet other survivors who have experienced similar situations and they can all support each other. Um, and create that bond through the, the trauma that they have experienced. Um, 
We have our, our CSEC prevention curriculum. So our advocates and our, especially our children and youth advocates, they have been trained um, in different curriculums. One of the most um, important ones is the um, uh, My Life, My Choice and Ending the Game, um, where we really want to meet our survivors where they're at. So we're never going to force them to do anything or say anything that they don't feel 100% comfortable with. But through these curriculums, we've learned how to support every step of their own journey. So whether they want to use our 24-hour support and crisis sign to just call and debrief, and maybe they're going through um, you know, some PTSD or some flashbacks and they just want to talk to someone, we're here for them. Or if they're in crisis and they would really want to make a report, we're there for them and we'll go with them to make that report. Or if they've just experienced a SART and they would like for us to uh, go with them, we can definitely do that. We also do court companions. Um, like I mentioned earlier with one of my past clients who was going through the legal aspects of her case, um, uh, we had to go with her and um, be there as a support person through her courts, even though um, she, she really felt in her that it was her fault, but through education, and information and support, she learned that her actions were because of a C-sex situation, because of human trafficking and sexual exploitation. Um, and just reminding her, you know, you're, you're a child when all of this happened. So um, just giving them that education and that support that they need through every step of their own journey. We will never push them to do anything they don't feel comfortable. Like Maria said, if they wanna have the sexual forensic examination, but they don't want law enforcement, we can definitely advocate for them. So um, it's important to know in a lot of this arts, everyone's trying to do their job, right? The nurse is gonna try to get the information that they need. Law enforcement is trying, trying to get the information that they need, but we need to, our role as advocates is to make sure that the survivor is feeling heard, understood, and that um, it is, their choice and it's their journey and they get to decide what they want to do with this. So um, through our 24 hour support and crisis line, we always like to offer as many options as we have available. We would never give them advice or um, force them to do anything they're not ready for. Um, and so like Maria mentioned, we do have um, our safe house and in that safe house, we have a, a, a room specially for our a transitional youth or C-sex survivors. Um, so we've really created all of these programs in the best interest of the survivors, having in mind the many obstacles that they encountered through the journey of uh, healing and um, moving from victim to survivor. Uh, so thank you, uh, Jackie. I want to first um, ask if there are any questions. I know it was a lot of information. And while, you know, it's a lot of information, there's still more information that could be added to. Unfortunately, it is a, a, an overload of information. Um, this is where to go for more accurate information as well. If you do have questions, if you come across anything, especially as we mentioned, social media is not the, always the best. Um, while it's great, it also can cause some, um, unfortunately, um, some difficulties. Polaris Project, um, we have included the website here where they do work directly with survivors of human trafficking and CSEC, the National Human Trafficking Hotline as well, that survivors can be, victims or survivors can be uh, directed to, and then of course, Monarch Services. Um, Monarch Services has various types of, you know, we have flyers, we have brochures, we have um, youth right cards, that you know the different um, entities schools have um, for all these different services and the rights of uh, youth if you are in need of that please send us a chat please send us an email uh, we would love to have all this information in all of your organizations it is very crucial for us to really understand not only the fact that um, you know that there there could be some support that we can provide but also we follow trends and that is to best serve our survivors very holistically um so monarch services and of course katie hart um so this is just some information that we have here and um 
And um, also, I just want to just touch upon the fact that COVID and CSEC um, and the things that, you know, we have encountered, I mentioned briefly, but what do we, what do COVID-19 and CSEC have in common? And that is the numbers of human trafficking during COVID are very scarce, but we know that they have increased. Uh, we know that they're very existence. Um, we also know that it's happening within our community. So please um, be aware of it, uh, have that safe space for that survivor or the victim, um, especially when it comes down to youth. It is very crucial that we provide them with that confidentiality and that safe space. Um, it's also important to to note that um, it's happening and it could be our neighbor it could be that student that's sitting um, in our classroom um, and then of course also that they proportionally impact vulnerable people right um, especially the accessibility and we've seen that during COVID the accessibility has been um, definitely very uh, impactful, uh, particularly people who live in poverty. Um, and again, it's something that we have seen. Um, black and brown people, so those who are underserved are more likely to die from COVID and are more likely to be vulnerable to trafficking as well. Uh, so being mindful about that. And then of course, the other uh, things that we have seen in common during this time is racism and classism um, deeply impact both of the issues or just deeply impact the issues of. And then of course also, as I mentioned earlier, not only all of these and what has in common, but what has led to, which is such an increase in um, mental health, that now it's leading to ways of how to cope with that. And that might be, um, again, going into a situation like human trafficking. First off, do you have any questions? While um, y'all, if you have any questions, please feel free to type it in the chat or um, unmute yourself. But I do want to quickly invite everyone here today. Of course, thank you for being here. Um, I want to invite everyone to check out our website, which is monarchsec.org. And um, we do have every month these webinars on different topics. Um, we try specifically to outline them up with the awareness month. Um, so next month, it will be a topic around um, teen dating violence. Um, so if you go to our website and then um, you go under violence prevention workshops or my big community education, <laughs> what are the other, um, all of them are listed there and the registration links are there. Um, just in case you want to check them out and if, you know, there's a topic that you're very interested in or you feel very passionate about it, we want to encourage everyone to, you know, please attend and um, yeah, I just want to invite you to check it out. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Dahlia. Um, so in addition, I also want to um, just let everyone know that if you have any ideas or would like to, you know, work with um, our prevention uh, program specifically, our prevention program is very invested in training and providing all this great information to our community partners. Um, please reach out. We're here to educate and provide support. In addition, I want to thank everyone who's here today because this is the step. This is exactly what we want to see from our community is coming together to learn to be able to end violence um, and abuse eventually. Wonderful. Any other questions? And then here we have, um, please follow us. Monarch Services does have Monarch a website. Uh, we also have our Instagram, both our Monarch Instagram for adults and our youth um, Instagram. Our prevention team is constantly posting information on our different um, topics, but also how we can work more effectively with youth, youth especially because again, uh, we know the impact and all the challenges that our youth are going through currently within our community. Um, we also have a Facebook as well. Monarch Services. Um, we have a Twitter and TikTok. Um, as we mentioned, you know, Monarch Services is really invested in meeting the survivors where they're at, but also education wise. And we know that TikTok is one of the areas that youth primarily uses. And, you know, with all these topics and education, we want to be viral and we want to make sure that not only are we educating and learning, but also that we are working with our youth as well. We also have a YouTube channel um, where we post all of our web our webinars. And and we're keeping a, of course, library of education, education and information that we provide uh, within our um, prevention department. And we also have a blog. Um, so please feel free to follow us, like us, and subscribe. And um, once again, Dahlia will add our 
uh, contact information if you have any questions if you have any you know potential requests if you come across someone that you might feel that might be a survivor and you want to be able to support them more effectively if you do have a survivor um, and want to connect them to monarch and there's any challenges please feel free to email us um, and we're more than happy to chat with you Yes, we will share the slides and we will also um, have the uh, recording available as well for all everyone who um, participated in addition and we do post our um, our slides and then of course also our um, recordings on our YouTube channel as well. Wonderful. I want to thank everyone for being here. This is exactly what um, a strong community looks like is coming together to hear, but also to have these type of conversations. And um, I hope to see some of you at our next month's webinar. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you.